as the court pleases. Uh, the Lord, our witness for this morning is Mr. Prima Naidu. Uh, my, my learned friend, uh, Mr. Scott, will be uh, leading Mr. Naidu. Uh, but just uh, if we can just clear some uh, paperwork uh, before we commence, my Lord. Yes. Uh, only the week indicated that um, uh, we were reaching agreement on the translation of Exhibit G11. That's the <clears throat> South African uh, police circular that was issued in 1978 yes. uh, to all uh, division commanders in the uh, security branch dealing with the treatment of detainees. And Lord, I'm pleased to advise that we now have reached uh, agreement on the English translation by all the parties, and I can hand up the agreed translation. So you can perhaps remove your current G11 and replace it with... Um, and, and, and Lord, just to um, save you, your clerk uh, running up and down, we intend to hand up uh, a number of exhibits dealing with uh, Brigadier Roy Rus Swanpool. Um, these will be marked G151 to G157. And once you have them in your hands, I'll again take your lordship uh, through those exhibits. It'll be G15.1, uh, all the way through to G15.7. Uh, so that's Tunis uh, Yakubus Swanepoel, but more commonly known as, uh, as Roy Rus. Your Lordship will recall the um, uh, evidence in relation to what was discovered cell 209, that is the cell in which uh, the late Dr. Neil Agard was found hanging. And the Lord will recall that um, there were approximately 19 books, um, yes. chess sets, games, and, and the like. And I indicated to your Lordship that we will be um, leading evidence uh, to criticize the crime scene investigation in that cell. Uh, and my Lord, we intend to um, need evidence on uh, the man in charge of that investigation at that time, uh, which was uh, Brigadier uh, Woiwus uh, Swanapul. Um, so my Lord, the first exhibit we wish to hand up is the judgment of Motle J in the reopened inquest into the death of Ahmed Essa Timal, and the Lord, that judgment is marked G15.1. And the Lord, we're handing up uh, this judgment because uh, Royal <coughs> Swinnipal is mentioned no less than six times uh, in that judgment. Um, paragraphs 131, uh, 138, uh, 209. Paragraph 209 is where a detainee by the name of uh, Chiba <coughs> alleged that in 1963, Woiwus Swanepoel was involved in assaulting him and electrocuting him. Uh, paragraph 211, uh, there a detainee by the name of Mrs. Tweedy alleges that uh, in 1969, Woiwus um forced her to stand extended period and deprived her of sleep. Uh, paragraph 212, that's where Dr. Snooki Zikalala um, also alleged abuse by Roy Rasonapul. Uh, and then finally, paragraph 214, uh, where the well-known photographer Peter Magubani, uh, who was um, detained for extensive periods, um, and there the court um, concluded that Rora Swanepoel had um, forced him to stand on bricks for some three days. <coughs> the, Lord, the next uh, exhibit is G15.2, and that is an extract from the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, of South Africa. 
And this extract comes from uh, Volume 2, Chapter 3. And it's titled The State Inside South Africa between 1960 and 1990. And the extract consists of pages 194 to 196. We draw your attention to the heading use of torture in arrest and interrogation of detainees uh, from paragraph 120 onwards. And in particular, we refer your lordship to uh, paragraph 122, um, in which the Truth Commission deals with the fact that certain uh, police officers um, were sent to France for special training uh, in torture techniques. And one of those individuals was Roland Swanepoel. Uh, and, then, uh, and then paragraph 125, where a second um, <coughs> group of officers went to France in, in about 1968 uh, to attend a training in interrogation and um, counter-interrogation techniques. Um, one of those officers was Roy Rasonapal, um, and also Hans Gloy, uh, who the court in the Timor matter found uh, had been responsible for the death of uh, Ahmed Timor. <coughs> and Lord, the next exhibit is G15.3. That is also an extract from the final report of the TRC. Uh, and the extract is Volume 3, Chapter 6. Uh, the heading is titled Regional Profile Transvaal. And the extract consists of pages 540 to 542. Um, we draw your Lordship's attention to the heading Deaths in Detention, and in particular paragraphs 51 to 54. Uh, in paragraph 51, the Lord it deals with the death and detention of Mr. Suleiman uh, Saluji, uh, who died two months after being detained. He allegedly um, fell from the seventh floor of the then security branch building in Gray's building, downtown Johannesburg. Um, at that time, Captain Wobras Swanepoel um, were, uh, were identified as his uh, interrogators. Uh, together with Lieutenant H.C. Miller. And the Lord, that is the very same uh, Hendrik Christoffel Miller, who features prominently uh, in these proceedings, firstly as a colonel and then as a brigadier. Uh, brigadier Muller, uh, at the time of the Agate um, inquest, was in charge of the security branch in Johannesburg. Um, Swanepoel uh, admits that he was in the room and that he had been interrogating uh, Mr. Saluji um, at the time of the fall, but he denied uh, that any uh, violence uh, had been used. The Truth Commission found that he was responsible uh, for the torture and the death of Mr. Saluji. Uh, and then further down on that same page, paragraph 56, uh, the Truth Commission deals with the death and detention of one James Lemko. Um, according to the post-mortem report, the official cause of death on the night of 5 March 1969 was suicide by hanging. Um, however, a second autopsy found that um, Mr. Lemko uh, had evidence of uh, electrical burns. Um, Rover Swanepoel, Major Swanepoel at the time, testified that he had arrested uh, Mr. Lemko and interrogated him on the day of his death. And the Truth Commission then made the findings that uh, Rover Swanepoel had tortured um, uh, Mr. Lemko and found the security branch responsible for his death. The final extract from the Truth Commission is marked G15.4. And the Lord, this is Volume 3, Chapter 6, also under the heading Regional Profile of the Old Transvaal. The extract consists of pages 568 to 571. And we 
draw your attention to paragraphs 163 to 165. Uh, my Lord, this part of the TRC report deals with the public order policing, and in particular the role of the South African police during the time of the 1976 Soweto riots. And they highlight the role of Colonel Wawira Sonakul, who led a task force into Soweto, as well as Alexandria, in the first 24 hours uh, of the 1976 uh, riots. Um, and indeed, uh, they quote from a report um, um, authored by Sonakul uh, himself, where he says he made his mark and he wouldn't tolerate what was happening, and he broke the back uh, of the uh, organizers. Uh, and the Truth Commission made certain findings on page 570. And the next um, exhibit is G15.5, and this is an extract from the police file of um, Captain Johannes Zakaria van Niekirk, who together with Hans Kloy was one of the interrogators of the late Ahmed Timol. And the Lord, the evidence before the Ahmed Timol inquest was that Fanny Kirk and Gloy were brought in to break uh, Timol. <coughs> and indeed, um, Judge Motley uh, in the Timol inquest found uh, Fanny Kirk and Gloy uh, responsible for the death of Timol. Um, the police file of, um, of Johannes Fanny Kirk consists of multiple complaints of assault and torture. We draw your attention in particular to pages 140 to 141 Sorry, of the police file of uh, Johannes van Niekerk. So it's not with me. The Lord, it should be um, marked G15.5. Say in that to van Niekerk's police file. Exactly. Uh, pages 140 to 141. Uh, okay, that's annexed. 140, I see. Yes, we haven't annexed the whole file. It's just um, <coughs> yeah. okay. certain extracts. And we look under the heading um, styled A8 Count Six. There's a complaint yeah. made by one Kada Hassim, uh, who complains that um, in February of 1971 uh, he was uh, assaulted. By Colonel Swalapu. That would be on page 141 near the top. But this was in Greytown, was it? In Greytown, yes. It seems he was uh, a very active uh, police officer. And um, the Lord, the um, final or the penultimate uh, exhibit. Mark G15.6. Uh, um, this is a, a one page extract from the transcript of the Ahmed Timor inquest. Um, it's volume 9, page 687. And it deals with the evidence of uh, Jao Rodriguez. Um, and my Lord, just to uh, remind your Lordship that Jao Rodriguez was the individual who was allegedly the only man in the interrogation room 1026 in John Forster Square um, when uh, Timo allegedly, according to the police, jumped out of room 1026. Um, the, Lord, the inquest court found that um, Jao Rodriguez had covered up uh, the crime of murder. He was an accessory after the fact uh, to the crime of murder and he had committed perjury. And all those findings are at page 126, paragraph 35 of the judgments of um, uh, Justice Motler. Um, and that, in fact, was the first um, exhibit, Mark 15 point, G15.1. And my Lord, if you turn to uh, page 687, uh, you'll notice that in the evidence, um, Jao Rodriguez uh, admits that it was uh, Roy Roswanapul, who he knew very well, this is about halfway down the page, 
and who had recruited him into the security branch. Below then the final um, exhibit is marked G15.7, and this is also a transcript, a page from the transcript of the Timon inquest, uh, volume 15, page uh, 1052. Um, my Lord, this deals with the evidence of one uh, Seth Sons. Uh, and my Lord, you will recall that uh, Mr. Seth Sons um, has already been implicated uh, in assaults and torture before these proceedings, uh, as he was um, implicated before the Timor inquest. Now, Mr. Seth Sons had uh, denied that there was any torture that took place uh, at John Forster Square. Um, the representatives for the Timor family put up five affidavits implicating him in serious acts of torture. And the Lord, if you turn to uh, the attached page, that's page uh, 1052 of that transcript, uh, you'll see the uh, leader of evidence puts it to Mr. Uh, Seth Sons that it was Walter Swanepoel who had recruited him uh, into the security branch and Mr. Sons um, uh, conceded that and said it was because he was a, a good candidate. So, my Lord, we will be um, submitting in, in due course that the man in charge of the crime scene investigation in cell 209 on the morning of 5 February 1982 turns out to be one of the most notorious police officers um, in the former South African police, um, and we will be making uh, further submissions in this regard. Um, Lord, that, that completes uh, the paperwork for this morning, and with the leave of the court, I will now hand proceedings over to my uh, learned junior, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much. Before, before we call the witness, it's just a matter of logistics. Uh, Mr. Mr. Naidu is is hard of hearing, uh, which will become apparent during the testimony, uh, the genesis of that. But the difficulty he has is that his hearing aid can only tune into one particular individual at a time. So if there is interaction from the court, then just let me know if any of my colleagues wish. He just needs to face the person that's talking to him at any given moment. Indeed, my Lord. So, Mr. Nida has also prepared a very brief supplementary affidavit. It's three pages, and uh, with the need of the court, I beg you to hand it up. And on my account, it would be annexed G16. I've already given a copy of the affidavit to our learned colleagues. My Lord, G16, I believe. Uh, Parmanathan Naidu. Do you object to taking the oath? I'll have him. Do you swear? Do you confirm? Yes, I do. Do you confirm that the evidence you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I, I confirm. So help me God. 
throughout me. Mr. Nadia? Good morning. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Um, I've explained to the court that you have to look at the person you're talking to. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Mr. Naidu, I just before we start with your evidence, you've prepared two statements that have been entered into exhibits in these proceedings. The first one was signed by yourself on the 26th of July, 2018. That's correct. You confirm and attest to that document? Yes, yes I do. And the short supplementary affidavit that's just been handed out <coughs> that you signed on the 30th of January this year. That's correct, yes. You confirm and attest to it? I confirm and attest to that. Thank you, Mr. Naidu. Mr. Naidu, could you describe where you were born? I was born in Dornfontein, Johannesburg. I come from a highly political family. And uh, I believe they... They were also activists that participated in various forms of activism during and before the struggle. Yes. My father was a political activist. My grandfather was an associate of Gandhi. My eldest brother was sent to 10 years on Robben Island. And my sister, who is here today, was detained and tortured by Swanapur in 1969. Come from quite a long tradition of uh, activists who have all done their bit as part of the liberation of our country. That's so correct. Very proud, uh, very proud accomplishment. When did you, Mr. Nadu, begin to identify and participate in, in activism of your own? As I've indicated, we grew up in a political family. As toddlers, we used to attend meetings demonstrations. I was first arrested when I was 15 for giving out a set to leaflet. I was charged for trespassing on railway property and uh, sentenced uh, 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 and cautioned and discharged. I didn't say it was sentenced. I, wasn't, I don't know what the exact legal term was, but I was found guilty, cautioned and discharged. And the reason you weren't um, imprisoned and cautioned and discharged was? Because I was under age. I was under 15. So your first, uh, the first time you were arrested, you were 15 years old? Yes. And you said SAC to? South African Congress of Trade Union. Thank you, Mr. Knight. So what was the state of the nation when you were engaging in these early activities of yours? <coughs> Apartheid was quite brutal years. Uh, our home was regularly raided by security police. Uh, and in later years, our home was attacked. Bricks were thrown through our window. Our car that was parked outside was smashed. And in one instance, the night watchman who saw the people doing it, the white security police, when he approached them, they, they threatened him. So we lived under constant harassment throughout our lives. And as you grew older, you obviously became more active in what you were doing as part of your activism. What, what sort of activities did you then uh, move into as you got to Iraq? Well, during the Ravonia trial, after the sentence of Nelson Mandela and Ahmed Kathrada, the Mandela children, Zeni and Zenzani, lived with us. Uh, they called my mother Amma, which means mother. Uh, we enrolled them at a colored school in Dornfontein, and they weren't even there. For two or three weeks, the security police found out and insist the principal was very sympathetic. He understood. Uh, and they registered under the name of Untirara. And uh, they were expelled, literally. And they then went to school in Swaziland. So our home was, we had constant visitors from Mr. Mandela to Oliver Tambo, uh, Duma Norque. So our home was a total political home. You eventually decided to join the Transvaal Indian Congress. I was part of the Transvaal Indian Youth Congress, which organized meetings, demonstrations, and we took part in those as kids. Uh, then when the TIC was revived, I was, just after I was released from my prison sentence, I became uh, a member of the executive of the Transvaal Indian Congress, and I took part in uh, 
building of the UDF, the United Democratic Front. What was the uh, objective of the Congress? What did they say? The Indian Congress objective was to mobilize Indian people to take part in struggle in solidarity with African people. Uh, you must know that Dadu, Dr. Dadu and Dr. Naika signed a friendship pact uh, between colored and African people and said that colored and Indians and Africans will struggle side by side. So the Transvaal Indian Congress tried to conscientize the Indian community that our struggle can never be fought alone. It has to be fought with African people. So is this part of the whole non-racialism of the struggle and the idea that oppressed peoples were not oppressed as one particular group, but as oppressed? Yes. We totally grew up uh, believing in non-racialism. We had friends across the board. Many of them are here today. And our old struggle. Today I am a member on the board member of the Amar Katara Foundation and our theme is deepening non-racialism. And uh, taking you back to that time when you were in the Transport Indian Congress, did these <coughs> activities finally catch up with you? Yes, what, it did. What happened? Uh, before the, we revived the Transport Indian Congress, uh, the South African government set up a puppet election called the South African Indian Council. The South African Indian Council where they wanted Indian people, they called Indian people to take part in their puppet administration. And we organized a boycott. And in the Transvaal, the boycott was very successful. Less than 5% of the population had voted. We called on the community not to vote. Because you believed it was a sham? Because we believed it was a sham and uh, it was a separate chamber. We believed in one unitary state for all its people in South Africa. And the consequences of this and, and, and supporting such a boycott at the time, what happened to you? Well, on the 27th of November 1981, uh, we had just finished uh, the our campaign and my house was littered with posters and leaflets and all that. And in the early hours of the morning, there was a loud knock on the door. And it was Captain Sons and a few other security policemen who searched the house. Uh, they were quite abusive to, to me and my family. My two sons were very young at the time. They were abusive to them, told them that they would never see me again. He then drove me, handcuffed me, and drove me to John Foster Square. At John Foster Square, I was uh, fingerprinted, uh, photographed, taken to the district surgeon, and then taken to the 10th floor to Con Arthur Conrad, Major Arthur Conrad's office. Let's just hold up uh, at that point. When you say the early hours of the morning, what time are we talking about? Uh, probably about 4 or 5 o'clock, you know, it's difficult to say. Everyone was sleeping when you... Everybody was sleeping. They, were, they came in a few cars. Uh, they surrounded the house. I lived in a small council house in Lanasia. Uh, they surrounded the house. Uh, the people who were outside the house were armed. Not the people who came inside. I mean, they might have had their own thing. But the people outside the house were armed with rifles. So then the house was searched and you were then taken by Captain Sons to John Forces. That's correct. So... You then are taken to the 10th floor? Yes, after being photographed and fingerprinted and taken to the 10th floor to Major Conrad's offices. Pick up from there, what happened to you? Well, Major Conrad uh, was abusive to me, shouted at me using foul languages, Fs and Bs. He then introduced me to uh, a Major RB. And I'm not too sure whether it was Conrad or RB said to me, when we finish with you, we were going to call this place Prima Heights. They, they call, my name is Prima, everybody, but they used to call me Prima. You know, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, and 
And what, how, did you, uh, how did you interpret that remark that they were going to call the tent or the, the, the Prima Heights? I felt intimidated and I felt that they were going to harm me and even possibly even kill me. Why? What was the innuendo on the term Prima Heights? Well, they said that it used to be called Timor Lights and I know that Timor was thrown from the tent floor. I didn't know uh, Timor personally, but I followed the case very closely and I knew all about him. And, uh, you know, he was murdered, so and I thought that, well, they mean that they're going to do the same thing to me. Okay. So, so there's this abusive language. Besides that remark about the, the Prima Heights, was there also racial language? Yes, all the time. I mean, every policeman used racial terms. Kuli, Kuli Ehan Parts, Kuli Ehan Frack. Those kinds of things were used throughout my interrogation by them. So it starts off with a lot of abusive language and a threat. Did it escalate from there? Yes, and then, well, on the first day, uh, when Conrad walked out of my office, as I say in my supplementary statement, yes. uh, and this Major RB grabbed me by my shirt, then by my hand, and took my head and attempted to bump it onto the desk. But I resisted. And uh, so he didn't manage to give me a hard thump, but yes, he thumped my head. Uh, let's see. They then took me to a corner, put me there uh, to an in another office in a corner. There were quite a few security policemen there. Uh, and somebody then smacked me on my head and then wiped his hand on my head. I got the impression that he spat in his hand and wiped it on my head. Uh, I didn't see who it was, and I wasn't actually sure it is, but that's the impression I got. So let's just clarify a, a few things, Mr. Naidu. You mentioned the reason you deposed your supplementary statement. If we can just clarify that issue for the benefit of the court. You say here that the purpose of the affidavit was to correct an error you made in your earlier affidavit. Yes. And you then state that paragraph five of your supplementary affidavit that at paragraph 11 of your first affidavit, Exhibit G8, you had, I quote, been handcuffed at my home, sat in the car to JBS handcuffed, and remained handcuffed as I stood before Conrad. He pulled my hair and smacked my head against the table. Captain Sons was present in Conrad's office during the assault. And then at paragraph 6, you then indicate that issue with that statement is that it does not correctly reflect the sequence of events. Yes. So to your memory, what was the correct sequence of events? Yeah, you know, uh, that incident, as I say, happened in 1980, in uh, December, November 1981. Sure. And Arby was, that was the only time I think I saw Arby. So it slipped my mind. Counsel, that was, was that? Sorry, Mr. Naidu, the judges asked Arby if you can just spell and clarify the identity of this person for the judge. I think it's A double B. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Now. Yes. Sorry, uh, Your Honor. I've reached an arrangement with the judge that if he has any uh, yeah, questions, because I'll just I can only uh, hear yeah, one person. <laughs> no problem. So you were indicating that it, it, 1981 was. Well, when, when I made that statement, uh, it slipped my mind about uh, Major Arvi. Because, you know, uh, and then subsequently, when reading through. Uh, my evidence at the earlier inquest. Uh, it, it, I didn't remember it was actually him uh, that did, that uh, took my head and banged it on the table and knocked Conrad. It was an error and I apologize for that. That's okay. It, it was a long time ago and uh, it's good that you refreshed your memory for purposes of preparing for today. Do you remember that RB had any particularly distinctive features that how did you recognize this, this person? Well, you know, that was the only time that I saw him. I didn't, I don't think, you know, there were many, while I, in the period I was being interrogated, there were many security police coming in and out asking questions. 
and not sometimes not necessarily speaking to me, he was speaking to others. So I don't remember seeing him again after that. Uh, he was a shortish person, a bit stout. Uh, yeah. I just want to read out what you testified in the first inquest about that incident and just comment. My Lord, um, for the benefit of my colleagues, this is at page 1442 of the first inquest record, beginning at line 31 and then carrying over to the next page. Mr. Naidu is testifying and he says, Major Aubrey grabbed me by my shirt struck me a few times and asked if I was a member of the ANC and the SACP. When I replied I was not, he then grabbed me by my hair and banged me on the table. He then made me sit in a corner for a few minutes and another security policeman came in and took me to another room. That's the That's correct, correct state yes. of affairs. I had, uh, believe it or not, I did have some hair those days. <laughs> you said long hair as well. Yes, I had long hair. <laughs> Was that an act of protest or was it... Uh, well, it was a hippie culture. <laughs> <laughs> very, very well, this is the idea. So, you then, this, this, this immediate assault happens uh, at the hands of Major Aubrey. What happened next? As I indicated, I was taken to this uh, room and put uh, s uh, squat on the floor uh, in a corner behind the door. And then it was there that somebody hit me on on my head and then wiped his hand on my head. Uh, I just got the impression at the time. I didn't see him that he spat on his hand and then wiped it on my head. Uh, but that's just, uh, what do you call it, conjecture. You know, I'm not too sure about whether he did spit in his hand or what. You indicated you've identified a few people, a Captain uh, Sons, Major yes. Aubrey, or no, Major Conrad, Aubrey, I'm not sure what his, um, yeah, he was... He was also a major. A major. And do you, do you recall if, if there were any other interrogators present during this time? Uh, no, at that point in time, that it was on a Friday, uh, <coughs> after all those incidents, I was taken to myself uh, in John Foster Square. Yes. Taken. Well, before we get to the cell, uh, what, what was said to you besides the... the sort of verbal abuse, did you gain the sense of what information they wanted from you, what the purpose of the interrogation was? On the first day, that, uh, that Friday, when I was arrested and, you know, after I'd been to a district surgeon and all that, they uh, only said to me that the game's up, they know all about me, uh, they, you know, I'm a member of the South African Communist Party, the African National Congress, uh, things like, and this is interspersed with insults and shouting and things like that, you know. At every point people insult you, even when you're a person who's taking your finger and is insulting you, the person who's photographing you is, is insulting you. It's a very hostile environment. A very hostile environment. And obviously that drives uh, fear into you. Uh, but I had my senses at me and I said I'm not a member of the ANC or the SECP. Uh, that was on the on the 27th of November 1981, and they, they took me. By that time, it was already uh, uh, probably early afternoon, uh, and they took me to my cell at uh, John Foster Square. So I understand your evidence that initially you were not given a particular reason why you were being interrogated. Not on that day. Yes. No. You then indicated um, you were then taken to, to the cells. Yes, at John Fox Square. Just explain that process to us in as much minutia as you can. Well, I was taken to a, a fairly large cell that I think uh, was painted black. It was a cell that had a grill, mm -hmm. and then behind the grill it had a door, one of these kind of uh, metal doors. And the process of, of getting there from the front door? They, they took me down the lift and we went through a passage, if I can remember correctly, and into the cell. Do you, do you recall at some stage having to sign a book or 
No, I don't recall. Uh, what they did do is to take my belt off okay. and my shoelaces off. Yes. And, and what was the reason why they confiscated those items? From? They don't tell you. But, you know, uh, I've been, I mean, I had lots of friends and all of this thing, and I knew that was sort of a standard procedure uh, that they do. And they, they took my, so my shoes, they took the shoelaces and my belt off. Were you uh, placed in leg irons or handcuffs during... Not at that stage. Hmm. Now, um, you, you were then placed in your cell after this initial assault. What was your immediate feelings or reactions to to the events that had transpired that morning? Well, uh, obviously I was uh, quite, uh, I was uh, quite scared, uh, anxious, you know. Uh, on that Friday, I, I think, because uh, I was taken quite early in the morning, I, I didn't, I don't think I ate that whole day, you know. Uh, on Saturday morning, uh, I didn't see any security police. I just saw the person who pushed uh, a cup of coffee and a, and a plate under the door. Yeah. Uh, that had the same thing happened on Sunday morning. I didn't see any security police. I was just given uh, my meals. And what was the contents of your, your cell? If you can describe that to the court. Uh, as I said, it was a um, fairly large cell. There was nothing in it. And in one corner of the cell, was uh, uh, a sisal mat, and a sisal mat is a grass mat, and a uh, felt mat, and a blanket. Uh, it, I mean, if I may add that, I mean, the blanket and the mat was quite smelly, mm -hmm. the smelling of urine and those things. It wasn't clean. And you weren't allowed to take any possessions in with you, save for the clothes on your back? Nothing. On that day, I wasn't allowed to take anything. So, just just uh, returning then, you were obviously then taken for interrogation. Ma yes, on Monday morning, early in the morning, I was collected by, I think, an, an African policeman. And he took me uh, to an office. And I waited there, and then he... Smith, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Smith, or was it Warrant Officer Smith, I think, sorry. It was Warrant Officer Smith that came and took me to which I believe was his office on the 10th floor. He came down? To no, he didn't come to the cell. Who, who took you from the cell? There was an African policeman who took me from the cell. You have to sign out? No, I didn't sign out. Continue. Okay, and when we got to, when Smith took me to his office, there was, uh, I think, uh, the guy there in, in my statement, I talk about the gingerhead guy, and uh, another policeman. Uh, I, I mean, I, I named them all, uh, but on that particular day, there were three policemen. Okay. And one, of them, uh, one of them being? Uh, Lieutenant Smith. And the other, there was a guy with a sort of a ginger hair. Uh, never got his name. You know. And I think the other guy, uh, there were three people, the other guy, I think, they, they used to refer to me as Skalki. Skalki. Yeah. Skulky. It might have been short for one for fake. So you were then Yes, no, sorry, I, I, at, at that, uh, that where the interrogation had started, yes. and they asked me if I was a member of the Internal Reconstruction and Development Department. Uh, when I said no, I wasn't, and they said I was being uncooperative and they will deal with me. So a member of what sort of Internal Reconstruction Department? Yes. And subsequently, I heard that that was actually headed by Mac Maraj and Mario Squin. Reconstruction or reconciliation? Re they, their job was to reconstruct the underground. It was there was no reconciliation at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, um, 
me, the IRD, what, was that a band organization or was it associated no. with a band organization? Well, what I understand it to be, because I heard, it's, at that stage, it was the first time I heard that name when they asked me. I subsequently learned it was a department set up. Uh, Oliver Tambo asked Mac, if you read Mac's book, it's there, asked Mac to reconstruct the underground because, you know, the underground, the ANC had been shattered and to reconstruct it. And that's what they referred to it as the department of the ANC. It wasn't a separate organization. So the, the theme of the interrogation was they took a take of you, you were a member of the IRD. Yes. Uh, because uh, I knew Mac, I knew Mario Squin, and I suppose they assumed that I was part of the IRD. So, uh, how long did this interrogation then last? If one memory serves me correct, I uh, interrogated the whole of Monday. How did the interrogation start initially? Well, initially they were asking me what which cell did I belong to, who did I report to, those kind of things. And I kept answering them, I'm not a member of the ANC, I'm not a member of the SA, SACP. I told them that the first time I've heard the term IRD. They obviously didn't uh, believe me. And uh, I'm, I'm not too sure of the exact time. Because uh, my interrogation lasted that whole of that Monday. I was taken back in the evening back to the cell, collected again on Tuesday. And the same things are happening. And this time it was getting more, and they were getting more aggressive. They were punching me, poking me, smacking me, those kinds of things. And at some point, they asked me to strip. Okay. So to stop. To strip, to take my clothes off. Okay. So, so Mr. Naidu, just to, to clarify for the benefit of the court, the, before we get to the Tuesday, the Monday, you were interrogated? Yes. And what, what transpired at the interrogation? They were just firing these questions at me. And when I said I don't know anything, I would either get a punch or a kick, okay. a jab on, the, on my uh, ribs, okay. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Who would administer the punches and, and kicks and jabs? It was mainly wa uh, Warrant Officer Smith, the guy with the, the, the ginger hair and a guy in Skulk. Now, um, you've nev you said you've never learnt the identity of the individual with the ginger hair. No, I never heard it. So, my lord, if I might be permitted to hang up for the benefit of the courts an exhibit that was before the initial inquest court. Mm -hmm. um, My Lord, it's Exhibit um, B5.1. B5.1. <laughs> Thank you. My Lord, this is a um, affidavit. This is B5.1. Yes. Proposed to by Rolf Jakobus Fenter. And if you look, my Lord, at the third paragraph down, it's in Afrikaans, yeah. so take my translation with caution, but to translate the document it says, from the 2nd of December 1981 to the 5th of December 1981, I was assigned with the interrogation of Mr. With P. Naidu. The interrogation occurred in the office of Warren Officer Smith from the 2nd of the 12th, 1981 to the 6th of the 12th, 1981, and then the Farina administration. So, you've indicated that the three individuals was Smith, Skulky, and a person with a with ginger hair you cannot recall. Yes. 
I do not have a picture of Mr. Fenter, um, but I believe he will testify in due course. But I just wanted to place that on record, my lord. Um, and, and, and you can't recall if at a later stage Fenter might have interrogated you during that period? Is that the guy with the, uh, with the ginger hair? I, I, I do not know, Mr. Is it there was a Fenter? Yes. You know? Was this a different person to the ginger hair person? Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, because if, if you see my statement, I do mention a Fenter. Mm -hmm. you know. Obviously, he won't have ginger hair anymore, but I will probably be able to recognize him. Okay. Um, very well, Mr. Mr. Naidu. Let's, let's return to the activities of the first day. So, you are being punched, kicked, you're being asked about your involvement with the IRD. At the end of the day, it did not escalate you on that point. You're taken to assault. Yes. Please continue from there. And on the second day, they asked me to strip and things like made me march, keep my fist in a clench, first salute, telling me to shout a mandala, singing Kosi Sikalele. By strip, you mean take off your shirt? No, completely naked. Completely naked? Yes. In the presence of whom? These this three policemen that I mentioned, but there were people coming in and out of the room all the time. Mm. Other coming. officers? Sorry? Who was coming into the room? You know, I mean, there was Van Rensburg. There was Carr. Occasionally, I mean, at times, um, uh, Conrad used to come into the room. You know, uh, those kinds of things, yeah. Uh, and some of them would come, just give you a smack, kick you over, you know, uh, prod you, you know, and ask him, how's he doing? And somebody will make the comment, oh, he's not farts, he's still fresh, you know, uh, those kind of things. Now, when you say um, that there was these kicks and slaps, did you, were they more for harassment? Or did you, or were they, with the, how hard were they? Uh, they weren't too hard. Uh, they weren't too hard, yeah. You know, I mean. And, 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 but you were naked during this time? I was naked during this time. And what else would they do to you? Well, if my memory serves me correct, uh, probably at all. And then on Tuesday again, I was taken back to the cell. Often, late afternoon, and brought back. I think on Wednesday morning again, early in the morning, and this time they made me strip. And I think it was then that they tried to put a canvas bag on my, on my head. A canvas bag. Yes. Were you able to see through this bag? No, I wasn't able to see through it, but he did have. I think it did have a little holes in it. Now if we can just slow down for one second. You, you, you've indicated in your witness statement that after you were made to strip that there would be an act of elastic bands. Yes. Did that happen on the Tuesday? Uh, I think, subject, but I think it happened on, on the Wednesday. Could you describe that incident? They made me strip, and this guy, Skalki, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Skalki, I think, took elastic band and shooting at my penis. Shot at my penis? Sorry? Shot at what? Took elastic band and sort of a shot at me, uh, into my penis. Was it stopped? Yeah. Was it stopped? Skalki. And, um, I just want to say, I mean, look, these things happen. So many people did so many things. Yeah. I mean, they, that incident definitely happened to me. Yes. But whether it was exactly skulky or this or that, I might not be 100% sure on that. But the, the incident definitely happened. In fact, you, you say in your witness statement that there, there was a taking of turns with this elastic band. Yes, they took turns. The other people have also done, uh, did it to me. 
And people continue to walk into the room, people who weren't your interrogators? Yeah. At one time, I'm not too sure which part of it, they even brought a few women, white women. While you were naked? While I was naked, and they all had a good laugh. From, uh, Conrad himself came, and they mocked me and said derogatory things about me. Racial? Uh, racial things. And said that, you know, uh, coolies can't fight. Can't fight? Huh? It's a can't Yeah. You had the bag over you? So I, I had the bag over me for a short while. And I remember, I think I mentioned his name, one of the people, in my, or he, when he was taken off, he came and he took it off. And he said, I is not fast. And he said something in Afrikaans that they need to step up the interrogation. So, you got, you know, having, having gone over the first couple of days of your interrogation, what was the overall sense you got from these various techniques? Yeah. That Before, there was some point also that they put a plastic bag over my head. Yes, no, we, we will come to that. Mm. Just the incident with the plastic bag. But the initial phase of the interrogation where this sort of activities was going on, what, what, did you, what sense did you get of what they were trying to achieve? What were they well, I, sorry, I first got them, they were trying to intimidate me. They were trying to humiliate me. And obviously, the interrogation and the torture got worse and worse and worse. So initially it was just about humiliation? Yes. And what of intimidation and, and the odd smack here, punch, those kind of things. But you interpreted those smacks and punches as being part of the intimidation and humiliation. That's correct. Very well. Now, at, at, at any stage so far, had you been taken to see a doctor? Not at that. As I said, when I was first, before they, they even interrogated, they took me to see the district surgeon. After that, no. While I was at uh, John Foster Square, I, they didn't take me to see a doctor. While I was at Frenachem, when I complained, I suppose we'll come to that a bit later. Mm. But just tell us that, that, district, the, that district surgeon, what was, could you just recount that interaction for us? Well, that was the first, this thing, it was, uh, I think it was Dr. Jacobson. Yes. Uh, and he just asked me, he examined me and he asked me if I was well. And, you know, he said yes. And uh, that's it. It was uneventful. It was uneventful, yes. Very well. So, please tell us then how the next phase of the interrogation went about after these initial days. Well, uh, Wednesday, the interrogation became much more intense. You know, it was, I think, on Wednesday that they, I think they, put the plastic bag over my head. But I managed to fight them off and rip the plastic bag. Yeah. So, you, you inter you, you, just, if you could help us, I know it's difficult to remember what time is tonight, but sequentially, you're taken up to the 10th floor. Yes, sir. And what transpires there? On Wednesday. I can't remember the exact sequence, but, you know, made to do exercise, sit up, push up, uh, kneeling, and at one point they took my hand, uh, wrist, and handcuffed it to my ankle. I was naked, and this guy, Prince, came and he pushed me over, put his foot on my leg, on top of the uh, uh, handcuff, and took a key holder that, and started beating me at the bottom of my feet. Quite hard. Yeah. But I wasn't bleeding. It was just a kind of a flat piece of wood, and he was beating me. And he said, they said things like that, you will eventually break. Yes. Was it uh, Mr. Nari, I believe that you, you're hearing issues 
arose during this time when you became drunk? <clears throat> also at John Foster Square, uh, a guy came in, the security policeman came into my into my into the interrogation room and he said something, walked around and from the back he hit me on my ear because I was kneeling at the time and I went flying and my ear, this ear buzzes until today. There's a slight buzz into it. You don't recall who that is? I think it was uh, Stephen Whitehead. I didn't know at the time, but subsequently when I spoke to other people who he'd interrogated, exp uh, described him to me, and, uh, and then obviously much later uh, I saw a photograph, and uh, he was the person. Why do you think uh, this person, uh, who believed to be Stephen Whitehead, would have assaulted you from behind your... Uh, they vicious people. I mean, they do the most cruelest thing that you can ever skin. That even I won't do to my enemy. They do to you. They had no sense of humanity or anything like that. I mean, they just were cruel. So, on the Wednesday, they are hitting you on the feet with these objects. You're being made to do exercises. So exercises. Were there any other things that... Uh, as I've indicated, at some point they put a plastic bag on me. What happened that during that incident? They put me on a chair that had a little armrest. They held my arm. Two policemen on either side held my arm down. And they put this plastic. But I managed to force my hand free and rip the plastic off. And they told me next time they'll use a heavier plastic. The, the plastic being such that would not be able to breathe. to breathe. Did you get the sense that they were trying to kill you? Yes, I think they were trying to kill me. That was based on, if you could explain what, what gave you that feeling. Well, I mean, you know, when they put a plastic bag over somebody's head, that's to suffocate you. I mean, I'm no expert, but I don't know how long you can survive on that. Yes. And what, I, what would have happened if I didn't managed to rub the plastic off. Yes. That was, a, that was a, probably on, on, on the Wednesday. So I'd just like to take you again to something that you testified about in the first inquest, which was during the start of the interrogation. It's at page 1455, the inquest judgment, uh, sorry, inquest record. And you say, you're being asked the question, what else happened that afternoon? Page 1455. It's at line 11 of the answer. What annexure is that? My Lord, it's, uh, it's, it's annexure A, of, uh, or exhibit A rather. It's the record of proceedings of the first in the rest. You say, uh, sorry, at, at line 11, question is put to you, what else happened that afternoon? You respond, I was also punched on my head a few times. The question is then put, by whom? By a man, I think it was Captain Fenter or Burster. He was a captain, a tall man with a longish nose. He was a captain in Fenter or Burster, I'm not too sure. Do you recall testifying to that um, and the event that it refers to? Yes. Please explain to us what happened at that time. You know, as I've indicated, I was kept naked most of the time, kneeling, sometimes with the handcuffs. And they, they used to come and they used to punch me with their fist on the head. Uh, and that, that, that thing was a guy, you know, with the name of Fincher. A tall man with a longish nose. Yes, that was what I said uh, at the time. Do you recall any any other features that might be distinctive? No, not at this stage. I don't. That's fine. Okay. 
you then uh, testify that you were also forced to hold up a chair in the air? Yes. Uh, when, that Wednesday, in the late afternoon, they took me to Vrenigene. Uh, they took me and they gave me my belt and my shoelace and took me to Vrenigene. And at Vrenigene, also I wasn't made to sign anything, anything. I was, it was late afternoon, I was taken to the cell, and which seemed about an hour or so later, I was exhausted by this time. They came, it was night time, I didn't know the time. They took me out of the cell and took me to an office. At Verenigen. Verenigen. Okay. And uh, Lieutenant Smith, a gingerhead guy, and Sculpey, I think, were present. They immediately asked me to strip. And they got me to do push ups, sit ups. Those kind of things. And I remember Smith who at one time, at one point said to me that when we kill you and your body is warm, the post-mortem won't show it. So he said. Hmm. Show what? Sorry? Show what? Why could your body not show in the I'm not too sure whether he meant the cause of death or whatever. What he said that uh, when your body is warm, when you do a post-mortem, they won't be able to. Okay. And it was at this point when you were then, this chair became involved? Yes. It was there that we all asked to do all, all sorts of things in Fenerton, holding up the chair, uh, at one point standing on a break making exercises, all those kinds of things. And at one point, somebody came and took this chair and sort of banged it. Because, you know, the back of the chair, that it was holding. And then he you know, took it and he forced it down. I was resisting, and he banged it on my head. Okay. Were there any other assaults at, at, at this time uh, no, no, look, they were difficult to sort of remember the sequence of things that happened, but they're doing the, all the time, uh, beating, making you do exercises, standing, barefoot, somebody would come and tramp your toes, those kinds of things were done continually. Can you just explain how the process went about being taken from John Forster Square to Berlin Well, they first from, it was, as I said, sorry, probably late afternoon or something, took me to myself to, the only thing I had, they had there was my shoelace and belt. Yes. And they took me, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to put it on, drove me by car to Frenachen. And at Frenachen Police Station, they <coughs> booked me in, kept the shoelace and the belt, and took me to the cell. It was already dark, and I had no idea uh, what time it was. And then suddenly, I, the cell doors flung open, and they took me back. They took me to an office. Uh, which I think was on the ground floor of Frenigen Police Station. And uh, it was uh, a policeman, an African policeman who took me there. And uh, Smith, Skalki and the gingerhead guy were there waiting for me. Did you sign your witness statement at Paragraph 20 that you saw Feroz Kachalia at the station. Yes, I forgot to mention. When they took me to Frenachen, uh, when they, uh, 
they made me stand against the, the wall and I saw Ferreus Kachalia. I knew him very well. Uh, you know, I knew his whole family well and he looked very distressed. You got the impression you had also been in the territory? Yes, you know. You then uh, say that at, at some point during your interrogation at Karenathan, your interrogators finally accepted that you weren't a member of the INRD. That's the impression I got, yes. What gave you that impression? Well, they weren't sort of talking about the IRDD. They were just talking about a whole lot of other things, and some of it even my legal activity. Uh, Things like uh, when we had this anti side committee, we planned a mass meeting in Lanasia. At probably somewhere around midday, they banned that meeting. We then moved that meeting to the Gandhi Hall. They banned that meeting either. We then moved the meeting to Lodium, which was a very successful meeting. And they were amazed that we had the capacity to do that. To, to be so responsive. So responsible. And then we were always two steps ahead of them. And they were amazed and they would mention these things to me and say, we know, you know, you're an old communist and you know how to, you know how to organize this kind of thing. So the line of questioning changed a bit? It changed a bit, but yeah. It, it, it continued. Then I think I mentioned that at some point yes. they gave me. They I was still there. They were, I was still naked, still marching. And still, they uh, because the the interrogation continued uh, on th the whole night. Uh, oh, left of Wednesday. It continued the whole of th Thursday, right around the clock. And at Friday, they gave me a pink liquid uh, to drink. Before we get to this, this pink liquid, you, you described how they kept you awake, what, what method they used. Uh, you referred to having been made to stand on something. Yes, they made me stand uh, on a brick. They made me do exercises, uh, you know, forcing me to do things. Although I was exhausted, but they did think. And at some point, they even put a newspaper on the floor uh, while I was naked and told me to lie down. Okay. And at one point, they even uh, put some chairs and told me to lie down in the chairs. Uh, but this was all in the office. Yeah, so, uh, so by the time we get to this pink liquid, you were, you were quite exhausted. I was yeah, quite exhausted, obviously quite demoralized, because uh, you never know when they're going to finish, uh, and you think they're going to finish you up. And yes, even the thing like suicide came to my mind. Can you just expand on that? I was totally demoralized, tired. So my body was so. Uh, you don't know when it's going to stop. They don't give you any. You know, you're going to stop. It's going on and on and on. And you sometimes feel that you know, death might be a better option. But obviously, I didn't go there. You then um, were given this pink liquid by your interrogator. Yes, and it was in a, in a glass, pink liquid, and they asked me to drink it. I asked them what it was, and uh, they said it's, a, a, it's called synatogen. Now, I remember in the old days, synatogen, yes, uh, those who are old enough here will probably remember it. Uh, in the old days, you could buy it from a chemist, synatogen. It was a liquid that's supposed to calm you down. Uh, I don't know if it ever worked. Or, uh, or I don't even know if it was that. And then, you know, I think they gave me some pearls to take with it. So you did drink it? Sorry? You drank it? Yes, I drank it. With pills? With 
pills? Yes, well, uh, I drank that first and then a glass of water with some pills and I drank that. And then what happened after that? Well, I was marching. And then I think I must have fallen off to sleep on my feet. So now, marching, you're doing the exercise of marching? Yes, you know, it's kind of uh, on my feet, on the spot, not uh, on the spot. And at some point, I think I fell off to sleep on my feet. And I started talking about things that they never even questioned me about. I was in uh, three political prisoners escaped from maximum security prison in Pretoria Central. One of them, a guy by the name of Stephen Lee, I didn't know him personally. I heard of him. He went to Shirish Nanabai, who had a shop in Becker Street in Newtown. He went to Shirish Nanabai's shop in Becker Street, and Shirish put him in his car and he brought him to my house. And Shirish then said, I've got Stephen, I heard it on the news. And I got Stephen Lee in that car. I said, Shirish, you know my house is no He said, no, no, we, I parked the car up two blocks away. I started talking about this thing. Because I then took Stephen Lee to a comrade by the name of Esther Basel who lived in Ilovo. And Esther Basel accommodated him. I then sent a message to my contact in Swaziland. And they told us where to... I never met Stephen Lee up to that point. I, never, never, I only saw him many years later. And we arranged for Stephen Lee to be picked up. And Stephen Lee was taken to Swaziland. And subsequently I heard recently it was Jacob Zuma that picked him up in Swaziland. <laughs> <laughs> but that I only learned that recently. <laughs> so by contact you mean AMC contact? Yes. Were you a member of the ANC at that time? Well, when you say I was a member, I wasn't a formal member, like a card-carrying member or something. Yes, I was a part of the liberation movement. And I lived in the center of Joburg. Our home was frequently visited by people. And yes, I used to get messages from Swaziland. And I myself wasn't involved in controversies where or planted a bomb. I never did that. But yes, I help people leave the country. I help people come back into the country. You know, those kinds of things. So you ultimately, as a consequence of taking this liquid, revealed something that you would have... I wouldn't have talked about. And what was the response from you? They were amazed. Because even they said, because the strangest thing is that on the night that Stephen Lee escaped, we couldn't find accommodation for him immediately. But right next to John Foster Square, there was a building called Makosa House. And some friends of Sherry's had a club there. And we hid Stephen Lee in that club, right next door to John Foster Square. <laughs> you know, they couldn't believe it because even they admitted they had to congratulate me. It was well planned. And, you know, and unfortunately, uh, I spoke. And that shattered me because I gave the name of Shirish Nanabai, who then got arrested. I gave the name of Linda Barnard, is the person who my contact went to Swaziland. And I gave the name of the person who accommodated him. And I felt I betrayed him. And that hurt me. More than the torture. In hindsight, do you know what the, what the liquid might have been? No, I've never been able to find out. <coughs> do you have any suspicions? No, I don't. I've spoken to a number of people. Uh, you know... One year that this Walter Besson was trying all kinds of things, whether this was one of his liquids or not, I don't know. 
I had never been able to establish that. So at this stage, um, what happened then with your interrogation after you revealed the information about Stephen Lee's escape? Uh, they put pressure on me to make a statement to a magistrate. And with all my issue, I said, no, I'll not do that. I refused. Just and that... Just before we get to the statement, Mr. Hardy, were you then kept at Karina Home? Yes, I was kept. They took me to the police cells okay. and then brought me out and asked me if I was prepared to make a statement to the magistrate. And I said, no. And that resulted in a few smacks and kicks and those kinds of things. At uh, paragraph 26, uh, you <coughs> say during this period there was a bizarre incident involving uh, Smith before Christmas. Oh, yes. Uh, it was during the, uh, after the, uh, I spoke, during the, it was just before Christmas, you know. They once came to my cell, asked me to put the leg irons on and handcuffed, and they put me in a car, and they drove to the, I could see they were driving towards the Val Dam. And in the car, they were saying things like, we're going to drown you. This is the end of you. Obviously, I was quite terrified. We drove around in Val, they were, it was the festive season, there were lots of people who were picnicking there. For whatever reason, they seemed to have then turned and went to Mayerton Police Station. They took me and they handcuffed me to one of these pipes on the outside of the station. And <clears throat> they went in and they came out and they made a braai. They gave me a piece of their meat, which I ate. It was, a, I could never understand why they did that, uh, what was the reason, and then they took me back to the cell. Uh, on another occasion... Well, if we can just stick with that, the, the, this incident involving the ball. Who, was, who, who were the officers who had escorted you that were taken? I think it was Warrant <laughs> Officer Smith, the gingerhead guy, uh, I think it was just the two of them in my mind, not with a scout. Because I know they were they sat in the front and I had no nobody sitting with me at the back, although I, I was handcuffed and chained. What was the what was the purpose of doing this? What was the point they had in mind? I have no idea what they did. Apart from the thing that they were gonna drown me. Just to intimidate me or what I don't know. It's possible uh, that uh, I refuse to sign a confession before a magistrate. Did you, did you ever then sign a confession? Did you sign a statement before a magistrate? Yes, Your Honor. Eventually I did sign it, but to them, to the security police. Not to the magistrate. Not to the magistrate. You then say after that incident you were, you were left relatively to your own devices in the songs of John Foster Square up until February 1982. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we can just talk quickly about the comings and goings. But of before that, can I ask you? Of course. There was one incident where in the middle of the night, I don't know what time it was, they also took me back to Frenachan. And they had a senior policeman who said he wasn't a security policeman. And he wanted me to sign a confession to him. And in the basement of John Foster Square, I refused. Before we went up to his office, I refused. And they started beating me at the, on the basement of John Foster Square and put, pushed me back into the car 
and said that you know, they had it with me, they're going to kill me. Who else who was involved? It was again Smith and uh, the guy with the ginger head. And they threatened to kill him? Yes. If we, um, if we just return to this period after um, December, where you're now left in solitary confinement, uh, sorry, you're left in con solitary confinement at Karina and Rhonda. Could you just tell us again about the comings and goings of, 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 of Korean and <coughs> what was in your cell? In my cell, there was a little bunker, a bunk type of thing, which uh, uh, had a felt mat in, you see, but to sleep. There was nothing else in the cell, but the cell led to a courtyard. And in the courtyard, there was a basin. And you know, in all this time, when I went back to my cell, it was the first time I could say a wash. And, sorry? But after my interrogation, I was taken back to the cell the first time I had a wash. From the time they arrested me, right up to the point that it took me after I made this confession to them and he took me back to the cell. That was the first time that I had a wash. How long was that, Mr. Knight? Sorry? How long, if you can estimate the approximate time between your arrest and... Well, I was arrested on a Friday, as I indicated. Saturday, Sunday in the cell. Then from Wednesday, right through up to about <coughs> Sunday, I was being interrogated. As I indicated at John Foster, they took me to the cell point. <coughs> I was kept awake and was at the first time. So it was like over a week, you know, <coughs> uh, that my interrogation actually ended on that s sort of a Sunday week. That, that's 10 days by my account. Yes, 10 days. My Lord, uh Am I doing okay? <laughs>
and it uh, and it uh, it didn't uh, I didn't sleep on the floor. It had a bunker, that kind of thing, with a with a mat on it, and slept. And uh, the cell had two doors. It had a grill and a, one of these solid doors, and then it goes into a courtyard. Then the courtyard had a grill. Now the courtyard was slightly bigger than the cell and it had a basin in it and sometimes they used to lock the girl and the door at night and sometimes they didn't and I had access to that. I was in solitary confinement and uh, when we were, I used to walk around the cell almost all day to a point where so I could sleep because there was nothing else to do. Well, uh, after time they gave me the Bhagavad Gita and then I befriended the, one of the African policemen and he used to bring me a James Hadley Chase novel. In the evening, I used to read it the whole night and give it, finish it and give it back to him in the morning. So when they raided the cell, they wouldn't find anything. So, so the, the Bhagavad Gita is a religious text? That's correct. Yes. So it was my wife, uh, they got in touch with my wife, and she gave it to them and brought it to me. And that was the, other than this novel, that And they gave me the Bible as well. This arrangement that the, uh, the, the officer would give you this, this novel, was that, a, was that a formal arrangement? No, 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 it was, in fact, you know, he was quite nervous. And giving it to me because he was just sympathetic. <coughs> uh, because if they caught me with a novel, uh, if, you know, obviously every question, was, how did I get it? And you know, he would have got into trouble. So that's why I had to read it, complete the whole novel. These novels are little novels. I finish it off at night and give it back to him in the morning. Were you allowed any games or puzzles? No, no games, no puzzle, nothing. Food items. Not when I was in the solitary confinement, I wasn't allowed any food items. And um, items of clothing? Did you just remain in the clothes on the No. Uh, my wife had to bring clothing to John Foster Square to the 10th floor. Okay. And they then would get that clothing to me. John Foster Square? Yes, my wife used to take the clothing to John Foster Square. And they would then bring it to me in Prenna. You then said that uh, the, the reason you have to read the novel overnight is because it might be found in your cell with regular searches. Could you just describe to the court what those involved and how often they were? Well, the, this is, the, you know, the uniform police from time to time, not every, from time to time they used to just come, well, there was nothing in the cell, and they used to just kind of look around, lift the blanket up and, the, you know, uh, look around. Uh, and then leave. Uh, so I had to make sure that uh, the novel is not found in the cell because that could lead to problems. Were you given writing uh, materials? No, I wasn't given any writing materials. And did they also search your person or just the cell? Not when I was in detention, I never got searched, but you know, when I was serving a sentence, you get searched regularly. So then you remained until. In in solitary confinement at the end of thing until February 1982. And then you recount that you were taken to see your wife and your mother. I had two visits. On one occasion, I think it was a few days after, or the day after that Neil had passed on. I was, they came to John Foster Square, uh, Smith, and uh, the injured guy put the leg irons on and just thing. He didn't say a word to me. It was the first time that they didn't even threaten me. They didn't greet me. They said nothing. Put me in a car and they drove me to John Foster Square in complete silence. When I got to John Foster Square, I saw a lot of activity in the basement. They and I was under the impression that they were going to now interrogate me again. And they took me to the 10th floor. 
and I was in a room when there were probably five or six or even more security policemen there, all shouting, screaming, and uh, I was standing there. Uh, they were insulting me, and my wife walked in, and they said to her, we're only giving you five minutes, and we don't want you to say anything to him. And she understood that, because by then she knew that Neil had passed on, not to say anything to me. It was a very unpleasant visit. Conrad was there. He was using verbal abuse to my wife. Sorry? Well, my wife on the first time came with my mother, who was quite elderly at the time, and my, my two sons. And outside, they, they allowed them up to the 10th floor. And they said to my wife, what the fucking hell are you bringing this old lady here? And he told somebody, take these fucking people back. And my mother and my son were then taken down. This obviously I learned subsequently from my wife. My wife couldn't tell me that they were there. And it was, it was, a, it wasn't, they, although they told her five minutes, it was less than five minutes. It was, they were shouting, screaming, insulting. Then they took, took her back. And then subsequently I had a visit where my mother and my two sons came to see me. That too was at the 10th floor. Now, just coming back a little bit, sorry. While going back to Frenachan, I saw a placard that says, detainee found hanged in his cell, something to that effect. When I got to Frenachan, I asked the African policeman who was on duty, well, what was that all about? That was on a Friday, and on a Saturday, he brought me the citizen. And the citizen headline read, Neil Agat uh, found hanged in his cell. That's when I first learned of Neil Eggett's passing. I didn't personally know Neil Eggett. So you, <coughs> let me get this straight. On the way back from John Foster to Frenachan? No. From John Foster to Frenachan, yes. Yeah, you saw a placard. Uh, newspaper placards. Right. Of the city, on the road. Oh. It was uh, on a pole. What did it read? It said something to the effect detainee found hanged in his cell or something like that. I don't remember the exact word. It was just in passing, I saw it. So it was on a Friday? It was on a Friday, yes. <coughs> and when you got back to Parenachem in the south, uh, someone brought you a newspaper? I asked the citizen what this is all about, uh, the, the constable who was on duty. And he didn't know, uh, that was on a, a Saturday morning, he brought me the citizen. Yes. Is that where you then found out? Like I, I read the article, yeah. I read it, and I had to give it back to him because obviously we didn't want me to be found in possession of the newspaper. Thank you. What was your reaction to learning, reading that newspaper? You know, well, shock and sadness. Although I didn't know you, but you feel sad that a uh, a comrade had passed on. And was it apparent from the article that he was detained at John Forster? Uh, I think yes. He, uh, the article said he was found dead at his cell in John Forster. And given that you've been detained in, in John Forster, what was your immediate reaction as to reading that article? Well, as I said, you know, obviously shocked and saddened. You know, and scared. You don't know whether that's going to happen to you next. What was your initial view as to how, how he might have died? I didn't, I don't think I had a view on that. You were then taken to, um, you left solitary confinement in Berlin in March, and that, it was at this point that you had this confrontation around whether or not you would sign your statement before a magistrate. Yes. And your position was? 
I refused to sign in front of a magistrate. And how did you interrogate this taker? They were very angry. They accused me of playing games with him. Because uh, they thought, they, I mean, in their view that I had broken, but I was now going back and, you know, because I also had my own pride and dignity. And I had to show them that uh, I'm not broken. Far from it. You say they drove you to Johannesburg late at night in uh, leg lines and handcuffs. You, you mentioned this instance. Yes, that time. was, uh, they took me there at some point, And then they, at the basement, as I explained, at the basement in uh, John Foster Square, they asked me that would I make now a statement to a this time they asked me to make a statement to a police captain and I still refused. And it was there, they beat me and I then decided I'll make a statement that I'll make it to you, to the security police, which I eventually did. Because my understanding was if I did that, I could always say that he did it under duress. You were challenged? This, this. I was challenged. Wherever, although all these things, where I could, I challenged them. and refuse to make a statement completely. That's fine. You, you then say also around this time that you complained to a captain who you recall to be Captain Stane about the buzzing sound in the ear. Yes. What had happened? How did that happen? Well, at some point, at Frenach, when he came to see me and he asked me how I was, I told him that uh, there's buzzing noise in my ear. And he said, he asked me how did it happen. I told him that I was hit across the face. Uh, he didn't say anything else. He left. A few days later, a policeman in uniform came to see me and said, I'm told that you... Sorry, before that I was taken to Dr. J Jacobson. And I told him also that I had the hearing problem, and he gave me uh, some medication, uh, which I took. And then a uniformed policeman came to my cell. He said, I believe you want to lay a charge. And he said to me, just remember, one hand washes the other. Uh, I don't know exactly, but I did interpret that as a threat. And I told him, well, no, I'm not going to lay a charge. And I told him, no, I won't lay. After he told me the one hand washes the other, he actually didn't just, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to make, uh, I'm not laying a charge. The one hand being, if, if you don't complain, then nothing will happen to you. I suppose that's what he meant, but yes, I took it, I understood that as being a threat. Now, uh, Mr. Naimu, following that incident of Captain Stain, I just have one or two questions, and I want to take you through some documents. The first is, did captains or officers regularly come to you and ask if you had any complaints or issues in the station? No, as far as I can remember, it was a stain, and I think the inspector of detainees yes. came, I think, twice. When he came, he always came in the presence of the security <coughs> police. He did tell me that he was independent of the Minister of Police. I also understood that the Minister of Police was also responsible for the security police. And I couldn't understand how I was that independent. So I refused to talk to him. I, I just said, no, I've got no problem to make it. Dr. Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson had his surgery. Yes. Any, yeah. Were there any other people who, who were taken to? I do remember vaguely once taken to the district surgeon in Frienachan. Okay. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry, I think it wasn't Jacobson that, uh, for my ear, it was a district surgeon in Frienachan. Okay. And he 
gave me uh, some medication, which never helped. So. Now, the, the three exhibits, my lord, that I just want to uh, take a witness to. The first one we've already mentioned, which is Mr. Ruth Fenton's affidavit, and that was before the first inquest as B5.1.2. But uh, there was a similar statement prepared by um, one officer Smith, and that is B5.1.1. Just hand that up to the court for your reference. And there was, in addition to that, an affidavit prepared by jo jo Johannes Jacobus Stein, and that was the B5.1.3. So I've just got a copy for the judge. I don't have a copy for Mr. Lyon. Oh, I can give you. <coughs> Thank you. So, do you still have the copy of. This document, 5.1.1, E5.1.1, is a statement made by William Smith. At the statement, there's, there's a number of things that are said, including the points at which uh, Warren Officer Smith uh, interrogated you. And I want to summarize the contents of the statement. Warren Officer Smith says he interrogated Mr. Naidu on the 30th of the 11th, 81. The first of the twelfth, eighty-one. The second of the twelfth, eighty-one. And the fourth of the twelfth, eighty-one. So, Mr. Naidu, first of all, there is uh, an indication about halfway down the page uh, where Mr. Warrant Officer Smith rather says, between the fourth of the twelfth, eighty-two, from from three in the afternoon. Uh, you were in his office, and there was then a camp bed in the office, which you slept on until 4 o'clock in the afternoon that day. Do you recall uh, having a camp bed and, and taking a nap? Uh, no, I don't recall ever sleeping on a, on a camp bed. I do recall at one time when he put some newspaper on the floor <coughs> and allowed me to, to, to to rest or sleep or whatever. And at one time they took chairs and you know they put them on opposite ends of each other, the backs, put chairs, and allowed me to sleep on that for a short while. But I don't ever recall them giving me a camp bed. If you then turn to the second page of uh, Warren Officer Smith's statement, there is uh, statement there in Afrikaans, and I've roughly translated it. The gist of it is that Warren Officer Smith says, during the periods of questioning you, you were not assaulted, threatened, or insulted, and you did not give any complaints in connection with this period. That's not What's true. Your reaction to that? That's not true. Uh, I was assaulted all the time, and you know, my ears is actually living testimony to that. I did complain to a policeman, and they sent another policeman, and he makes the remark that one end was to the other. So it's not true to say that I was never, and I never complained. And then if we can turn to Mr. Fenter's statement, which is B5.1.2. then says a similar statement at the penultimate paragraph of the statement when he says during the period of questioning uh, you were not assaulted none of the terms in my friend, you were not assaulted, threatened or insulted and did not complain so he says the same thing that Warren Officer Smith says What's your reaction to that? Oh, it's not true. 
I mean, beating during my entire interrogation, there was beating all the time. Insults. Everybody walked in, insult, shouting, swearing, all kinds of using racial derogatory terms, uh, sometimes not even referring me, as I indicated, my name was Prima. They all never could, I don't know, for whatever reason, they could never pronounce Prima. They used to say Prima. And uh, every second word was coolie this, coolie that, you know. No, I don't think I've got that one. Person who, sorry, say it again. Well, look, as I say, m many people hit me over the head. Yes. One of the things that I think that caused injury was this person, I think, who his name was uh, Whitehead, Stephen Whitehead. Yes. Look, it, it appears from this document that that, that that person was warrant officer Boyson. So, first, let me get your response to that. Uh, how would it have been or could it have been warrant officer Boyson? You know, Warrant Officer Boyson was one of my interrogators. In fact, on one occasion, you know, when I wanted to go to the toilet, most times I used to walk and sometimes with great difficulty. Because the John Forces were on the 10th floor. At the end of the tor corridor was a toilet. And at one stage when I was handcuffed and I wanted to go to the toilet, the boysons actually dragged me with the one foot to the toilet. When he got to the toilet, he, he opened the handcuff. So he was definitely one of the guys who was interrogating me and all these kind of things. And, but, you know, who did specifically what, you know, that is difficult to, to, to actually remember today. Fair enough. Context against which this statement is made by Johannes Stein is in relation to this complaint that you have already testified to. So the fourth final paragraph says, On occasion when Warrant Officer Boyson was not present, Nadu told me that he had a, whir a whistling sound in one of his ears. I then asked him about this and he said to me that he thought the cause of it was a hit that Warrant Officer Boyson had administered to him on one or other time. I confronted Warrant Officer Boyson with the allegation and he denied it. Warrant Officer Boyson then asked Naidu about the incident, the allegation, and then Naidu asked for forgiveness, or he apologized, and he said he did not know why he had made the allegation. Not entirely true. One, it might be Boyson's, and I complained about it. As I said, after the policemen that told me one, they insisted I apologize. <coughs> they, I never offered an apology. They insisted that I apologize to 
as you say, now rock war, boys and something. I don't remember all the details, but what I do remember is being asked to apologize. And I, 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 I don't think I apologized, I just didn't know them. But it was, the it was them asking me to apologize. Yes. Do you remember Warrant Officer Boyson confronting you with the allegation? It might be so. I mean, I don't remember. The, but what I do remember is somebody asking me to apologize. And in fact, if you read, it's in that other statement yes. somewhere. They're asking me to apologize. That I told them about the beating on my ear. I never apologized. And uh, the context or within which, the manner in which one Officer Boyson approached you, to your recollection? Yeah. No, I don't remember. That's all right. The next paragraph says, during the interrogation of Prima Nadu and my son, Boyson, Boyson's attitude with Nadu and us was very good. He often provided food and fruit, which he had purchased out of his own pockets. When he complained what he what, that he was tired, he was allowed to rest. Sometimes we would return him to the cells at his request, and sometimes let him sleep in the office of interrogation. The statement trails off. But the allegation there is that you were given food and fruit, which were paid for at the security branch's own pocket. You were allowed to rest, and you would be taken back to your cell at your request. What's your reaction? Uh, on, the, on the food, yes, they did feed me. But as far as I can remember, I got standard police food all the time. <coughs> Nothing special, mm. which, I, which I ate. I don't remember anybody offering me any fruit, and I don't remember. I don't remember asking, saying to them that I'm tired, I want to go back to the cell. I never requested that. As I said, Monday morning, I mean, they took in, they did take me back Monday afternoon to the cell, Tuesday afternoon to the cell. Wednesday, they took me to Frenachan. The, the comment that your uh, relationship with uh, your interrogators, between the interrogators and you, was very good. What is your remark to that? How can you have a good relationship with somebody who's kicking you, beating you, torturing you, insulting you? No, there was no good relationship. The statement then goes on and says, during the interrogation of Nadu, he never complained of assaults, except for the hit, the smack, which was allegedly given to him by Warrant Officer Boyson. The allegation is that he never complained of assaults other than that particular hit. It is true that the only time I complained, and I was in their custody, I was being interrogated, and the only time I complained about my ear was to stay. I didn't complain to anybody else. Even when I was making the statement to the security police, he asked me, was I assaulted? And if you read there, I, I told him I'd rather not answer that question. I mean, it was understand I was in their clutches, and I didn't want to be going through these things. So my response was, he asked me if you were being assaulted. I said I'd rather not answer that question. Because I knew if I said yes, and this and this person, it would have been more beating. And, and that I think is a very rational approach considering the situation. But the final paragraph uh, says, and a sustained statement, neither was never assaulted in my presence or handled roughly. Well, that's not true. We now get to the point where you had finally signed your statement, but before a security branch officer, and you were then moved to the awaiting trial cells at Gonfoster Square. What happened after that? 
you know, it was remanded to a later date. Uh, we then pleaded guilty. <coughs> Myself and Shirish Nanabai, when the trial actually started, we pleaded guilty. And we were sentenced to three years, out of which two years are suspended. Now, normally, <coughs> in court, because I felt that after all what I've been through, I had to show some form of defiance. And the gallery was packed with family, friends, comrades. And I stood up and I gave the clenched first salute and shouted a mantra. The policeman, white policeman, pushed me down the stairs. And my mother screamed because all they saw me being pushed. And they didn't see anything after that. That made big, it made headlines in the star. It went around the prison. Now normally when you sentence, you take him to the prison in a prison truck. But this time, Stain took me and Shirish to the, uh, to the fort prison. And I don't know what they said to him, but they put us with the common law prisoners. First of all, when we were, uh, sorry, that happened when we were on waiting trial, not when we were sentenced. And we were put in uh, with the common law prisoners, and then when we were sentenced. So prison is not a pleasant place for anybody. Terrible thing happens in prison. We were, and because we showed active defiances and all that, we were not molested by the prisoners in any way whatsoever. They had a kind of a respect for us. Uh, you know, you get these prison gangs that assault people and do all, but they never did anything like that to us. Uh, so we were there, first in a waiting trial section, and then uh, serving the sentence. We were nine months at the fort and then taken with other prisoners to the new prisoners which they called Johannesburg prison which was popularly known as Sun City at the time and we finished serving our th the remaining three months of our sentence and released from there. Mr. Nadu's appeal to the That's correct. Kathy Satchel was my attorney, and uh, I was approached by her, which I then made a statement. And I gave, actually gave evidence at the end. Yes. What was your recollection of the courtroom and the proceedings? Look, first of all, when I was brought in, in uh, from the fort, both myself and Shiris also gave evidence. We were in prison clothing and in chains. When Bezo saw us, he objected. And my wife was asked to bring some clothing. And I then turned into civilian clothing and they removed the chains. Uh, I remember giving my evidence and then being cross-examined. You know, I mean the whole thing is recorded here. I don't remember too much of that kind of thing. Who was in the courtroom? Well, the lawyer for the Agate family, one of the lawyers, I think was George Bezos. I mean, he asked me a few questions. I don't remember anybody else. The, the public gallery? There were lots of people in the public gallery, but I don't remember specifically who. 
allegations being made that there were many security branch officers? Actually, I think that, yeah, there was. I mean, I didn't notice that, but uh, generally these things, the security branch officers come in and take the place. But yes, look, I want to say I don't really remember that. No, no, I wasn't. Uh, I was. I, I wasn't reluctant at all. I wanted to give evidence. I wanted to tell the court and then the world at large of the kind of treatment that mattered out to me. And I know. I have no doubt about it that uh, Neil Eggert was given the same treatment, or probably even worse. <coughs> I said that, you know, what had happened to me yes. happened to probably to Neil Haggard and probably even worse. And what was the basis for, how did you reason? Well, that they killed him, you know. Uh, that, you know, uh, That's what you they, really look, when they tortured me, you know, they push you to the brink at any time. You could have died. I mean, when they put the plastic bag over me, I could have. I mean, these things could have happened. You know? I mean, uh, I know of many detainees who, who were tortured. I mean, and you were aware of the ultimate finding reached by the inquest court that uh, nobody was to blame, and he committed suicide. Yes, I was aware of that. What, what was your reaction when you learned that? Well, I just thought it's a, it, it, it a whitewash. You know, at the time, I mean, there were many uh, inquests. Uh, there was Neil, uh, there was Pablo Saluji's inquest. There were many. And all these inquests, we knew, were just uh, a, a whitewash. Mr. Um, Mr. Naidu, after your release, you... Uh, then went on to keep yourself fairly busy with a number of other political activities in the state of emergency heading into the early democracy. Can you just account them for the court? Yes. I was released, I think, on the 1st of April, uh, 1983. 1983. Sorry? 1983. Yes. On the 1st of May, 1983, the revival of the Transvaal Indian Congress took place at the Ramakrishna Hall in Lanasia. I attended that meeting with my family and I got elected onto the executive of the Transvaal Indian Congress. We then uh, took part in the activities of the United Democratic Front. I went with my family to, Crado, uh, to uh, Cape Town, to Mitchell's Plain, where I was present at the launch of the United Democratic Front. The United, I was released in April. The United Democratic Front was launched, if my memory serves me correctly, on the 19th of August. 19th of August. 19th of August, 1983. I went, I was there present at the uh, launch. I then became very active in the TIC and the United Democratic Front. When the three comrades in Craddock were murdered, I went by bus uh, to Craddock. We traveled the whole night. I went to the funeral. It was an amazing funeral, if I may say so, my Lord. There were thousands of people. And it's the first time in my life I saw a huge banner of the South African Communist Party. I couldn't believe it. We attended the launch, and on our way back from Craddock, as the bus stopped in Lanasia for me to get off, a young policeman pointed a, an R4 rifle onto me and told me to get onto the bus. Most of the people in the bus were of Indian origin, and they again, this young policeman, not security, started uh, shouting racial abuses at us. There was an elderly woman there, Mani Ben Sita. They had no respect for her. She even told this youngster, young man, 
Didn't your mother teach you any manners? He was a bit embarrassed, but he continued. Then they drove us to uh, Protea Police Station, and we were detained under the state of emergency. From there, we were taken to the Johannesburg Central Police uh, Prison, same city, the one that I stayed. And I was there for about two weeks. I was released. And about two weeks later, I was re-detained. And this time I was kept for six months until the end of the state of emergency. When the second state of emergency was declared, we had a top off that there was going to be a state of emergency declared. We also had our contact in the security police. And we had a top off and I left home. A few hours after I left home, my house was raided and insisting to my wife where I was. And I spent the rest of my time underground while the state of emergency was the same. And then I came out of uh, hiding when the state of emergency was lifted. Mr. Naidu, my final question to you is really, after 1994 you held a number of auspicious positions. Um, could you just let us know what the highlights were some of the roles you held after 1994. Okay, after the 1994 national election, which took place in April, the, for local government, they set up what they call a pre-interim <coughs> council. And the Lanasia area was known as the Southwestern District. It wasn't an elected body, uh, it was an appointed body. And I served as the mayor of that substructure, the chairperson of council. Then there was a local government election that think, took place in 1995. And Johannesburg was divided into four substructures, south, west, north, east. And I was the chairperson of the executive committee for the Southern MLC. In 2000, when Johannesburg was declared a metro, I was again elected as a councillor and I served under Amos Masondo as the MMC for health until 2005. After the 2005 local government election, again under the chairman of Amos Masondo, I was made the minister, local government minister of environment. I only served there for about three years, and then I was made the chairperson of chairs, which I served until the end of that term. And then in the last term, I retired in 2016, but before that, I was the Chief Whip of Council and the Chief Whip of the ANC. And I retired in 2016, August 2016. Now I take care of the grandchildren. And the Ahmed Kathar Foundation. Mr. Tanad, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, or remark in this interest? I always respected and admired the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Your Honor. It was not perfect. It had a lot of flaws. But it, I think I respect it. And the people that interrogated me, and I think Neil and others, never came forward to give their side of the story. And I think the law must take its course. And if need be, they must be prosecuted. I think they were given an opportunity to come forward. I gave evidence. My whole family, every member of our family, gave evidence at the TRC. They didn't. So they need to be prosecuted and the law must take its course. Thank you.
completes my examination. Hello, I see it's almost half a shell. Our colleague has religious commitments. Oh. May I be permitted to stand down until Monday to put questions to Mr. Nigel? Thank you, Hello. Yeah, you're just a member of the uh, 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 Mr. Nigel, unfortunately, uh, there's still some few questions or I don't know, questions to the Unfortunately, one of the concepts is to, to, to go to the mosque. So we can't proceed for the rest of the day today. So we have to come back on that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, and David said that, uh, just one word, you are still saying that I think you can just come back on Monday. Okay, I'll come back on Monday. Monday morning, 